Hello. <clears throat> I think we, uh, we can go ahead and get started. We've got a lot to cover as usual. So welcome to the Sprint Review, um, Folio Sprints 44 and 45. It's our ever-growing list of teams. I'm just gonna cruise through these intro slides. We do have a couple of new team members, um, Peter Murray. Uh, many people know Peter. He's been working on Folio as a community organizer and advocate really since the, the beginning of the project, but he's now also joining the ranks of the PO team, um, and he's going to um, take the lead on a workflows proof of concept. Um, he's going to be working to explore a um, workflow platform called Kamunda um, to better understand um, how it could benefit Folio. So we're psyched to have you on the PO team, Peter. And we also have a few new developers on the FolyJet team. Can I get there? Here? Oh, there they are. All right, so FolyJet is a relatively new team and um, the team is growing. So um, looks like we've got Demetrio, Katerina, and Alexander all joining the team. So welcome, guys. Okay. So moving on, there were a couple of things um, we wanted to touch on before diving into the actual um, demos. Um, one is this um, definition of done. So the Technical Council has been working on a document, um, which is linked to from this deck, which I'll send out, um, which outlines the definition of done, some criteria for the definition of done. And the idea of this document is to establish a shared understanding across teams of what level of quality is expected for something to be considered complete at different stages of the process. So for example, what does it mean for a story to be done um, and closable, a user story? Or what does it mean for a feature to be releasable? Um, and this document has a lot of criteria. It's gonna take us time to implement them all. Um, but um, beginning with this review, we are um, implementing a, one of these criteria for um, the demo. Um, and that is that um, we'll only be showing work in the sprint reviews that has passed QA. Um, so um, this is um, a bit of a change for some teams and will likely mean a reduction in the amount of work shown, um, but that'll be temporary and um, will rectify itself probably by next sprint. Um, and we will also make exceptions to this rule. So if there's something that just had, you know, there's work in process that we haven't seen in a long time, um, you know, we might make an exception and, and take a look at it, even if it hasn't been tested or if there's a proof of concept or something like that. We just ask that the teams or the developers demonstrating that work just make it clear that um, what they're showing hasn't passed QA. Kate? Yeah. Can you explain what passed QA means? Is it... Um, user acceptance testing? Is it just um, kind of automated testing? So for now, it is, um, it is manual testing. And automated testing usually happens as well. Um, but for, um, for this, for, for this um, pass, it's, it's manual test. Um, so what happens is, um, and this differs team by team, but say for the core team, what happens is a, a user story will, will be in progress by the developer, then it will be marked when the developer is complete, they mark it in review. At that time, um, tests, you know, automated tests are, are being written. But we also, what we use to determine whether or not something is demoable is has, you know, the the product owner or some of our other manual testers actually gone in, reviewed all the acceptance criteria or scenarios and marked it done. So that's not to say there is, there aren't other tests written. Um, it's just, you know, the, the, uh, the definition of done here is the manual test. Does that make sense, Emery? Yes. Thank you. Cool. All right. Um, okay. So that's, that's that. Um, one other thing we wanted to talk about was the Q3 release timeline, and I'm going to hand it over to Jakob to discuss this slide. Thanks, Kate. Uh, can you hear me? Yeah. All right, so I'll just use your, uh, your slide here. Um, 
to give us a little bit of context uh, at some point uh, in the past around the meeting in Durham we decided to switch uh, over to a quarterly release cycle uh, with Folio, meaning that every quarter will produce a release. Um, uh, we have started with Q2 2018, um, and at this point we produced uh, a, uh, a release that was based off uh, snapshot uh, uh, releases. What that means in practice is um, that Folio is focused has been focused uh, uh, until now uh, on development and getting uh, features out to the integration environments uh, primarily. So that's the main focus on, uh, on all the development work. Uh, getting that out to those integration environments so that uh, manual testers, which Kate mentioned, have, uh, can, can see the feature, can, can review it, can confirm that it's working. Um, and that was that's working well for uh, for you know for sort of constant continuous development. Uh, uh, it's not working uh, uh, well when you want to sort of freeze uh, the product at some points and have a clear understanding what is uh, uh, what is in the package when you ship it. Um, and also, it doesn't work that well when you want to plan what's going to happen, what's going to get delivered in the next in the next quarter. So, so we started introducing the notion of quarterly releases. And as I said, we started with Q2. And Q2 was just building on top of the continuous, uh, continuous integration process we have in-house. So uh, as the environments get constantly rebuilt with new features and uh, automated tests are being run on them, at some point we have a stable, uh, stable release. And we can take a, uh, a, an image and a, 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 a version of that, that stable that stable environment and package that as something we distribute to others. And that's what we did with Q2. So we didn't do anything beyond just taking a, a, a point in time snapshot uh, that has passed, uh, um, that has passed uh, integration tests. Now for Q3, uh, initially we planned to do a similar thing, but, uh, uh, but we have gathered got our DevOps and developers. And the feedback was that we really need to start getting uh, um, serious about releasing individual artifacts. So Folio is a is a big project, it's a good at project uh, that consists of uh, different modules, libraries, uh, frameworks, um, uh, supporting code, and so forth. So all that code lives um, uh, in its own uh, GitHub repos. Uh, it goes undergoes its own sort of release cycles. Uh, some were consistent, other less consistent, uh, uh, and we have decided that to make a proper release, we need all that code to have a consistent release cycle, uh, and all the building blocks need to be released so that in turn we can create a a folio a folio re quarterly release. This will obviously have an impact on how those individual modules are versioning and released. In some cases, that impact will, will be very little because, as I said. They're already consistently released. This is mostly backend modules. In other cases, um, the impact isn't huge because the, the release clusters are understood. Uh, those are usually the core team UI modules. And in other, and, and, and also in other cases, it will require just putting in place a release procedures which haven't been there before. Um, so that's that's the context. And uh, for Q3 specifically, <coughs> we did not really have the um, the luxury of working uh, working on the release plan um, uh, without any time constraints as, as, uh, as, as it's usually the case. So we had to work backwards from the dates a little bit. So uh, the Q3 ends on uh, October the first. Uh, so we had to we had to prepare a plan uh, that uh, that works with that deadline in mind. Uh, so the the timeline is really tight. Um, uh, but the feedback was largely that it's doable. So, uh, so, uh, so that's what we're gonna go with. And also, uh, the main purpose of this is just to test the release procedures, test uh, the, the release planning, inform the Q4 release, which is uh, which we expect uh, um, uh, to be shipped to the customer, the first uh, person, uh, first implementer. So, uh, so that's the context. Um, now let me just walk you through the timeline very quickly because I know, you know we don't have much time. Uh, Sprint 46 has started yesterday, uh, for, of course, some people today. Uh, by the end of this week, 
or essentially by the by the by the, by the beginning of next week, September the tenth, we have a deadline for external modules. Um, uh, so those modules have to be feature uh, complete, uh, uh, meaning include all the features that we want to ship with the Q3, uh, and they have to be prepared for integration. So uh, they have to be versioned and released in their corresponding repos. <coughs> And for code, uh, that uh, is not a uh, separate module, but it's just a pull request to the, uh, to the core modules, those pull requests need to be issued before that date. Um, uh, this will let the core team uh, DevOps to uh, perform integration uh, the following, I mean, this week after, after, after the deadline. Um, uh, the, uh, uh, the, uh, the next deadline that is, uh, that is important here on this timeline is the future freeze for the internal module, for the core key modules, I should say. Uh, so that's uh, Thursday, September 13th. Uh, so any, by this date, we expect all the, all the core team modules and libraries to be released. Uh, so all the functionality that has been taken on and Sprint 46 uh, needs to be completed by this uh, time or it will be delayed until the next release. Um, and on September 14th, we'll make an attempt to create a, a new environment, a Q3 environment of the ROS release artifacts. So it will be an independent environment, um, uh, a new environment uh, uh, running alongside uh, the snapshot and snapshot stable and testing, uh, which some of you guys know and, and use. Um, we'll have a week after that, um, which will allow us to catch any issues, any critical issues on that environment. So this environment will be running and we'll have manual testers repeat testing on that, uh, that frozen environment, uh, meaning that the environment will be not moving in terms of features. It will be a, a, a fixed target uh, and we'll be only providing bug fixes. So anything that is discovered that can be fixed will be fixed. Uh, things that cannot be fixed uh, will be noted as a known issue in the release, um, in the release um, um, change log. Um, by the end of the next week, so Sprint 47, September 17th, we'll uh, make an attempt to rebuild that environment. Um, uh, and the following week, um, um, and the September 20, 21st is when the release will be stabilized and it will be uh, ready for external testing. Um, so external testing will be performed on the, on the uh, on a, uh, environment uh, that is set up independently from with the core team, the environments the core team operates, uh, and it will get some additional uh, verification uh, um, uh, based on uh, based on those those you know that different environments, and uh, we'll try to address any issues reported during during this week. Um, we assume this will be mostly packaging issues or scripting uh, problems, install problems, maybe some documentation is unclear. Those will be addressed and uh, the release will be uh, relabeled, retapped, and finalized by the end of this week, by the end of uh, Sprint 47. And we'll put it up for, uh, for public consumption uh, uh, the following Monday. Uh, that's the beginning of Sprint 48. So that's essentially the plan. Uh, as I mentioned, it's a really tight timeline, but we're hoping um, it's doable. Um, are there any questions about the release process or, uh, or the timeline? There may be questions, Jakob. I guess maybe in the interest of time, we can uh, direct people to you if there are questions. Exactly. So I'll just I'll just men mention because I know that we're uh, we're in a rush. I'll just mention that there is a channel started on Slack, release Q3 2018 uh, channel. Um, uh, uh, a lot of people have been invited already that participate in the release uh, that are leads for individual projects for POs for uh, for different features. Uh, if you if uh, some of you guys want to join the channel, you're welcome. You can track the progress of what's released on that channel. Uh, and that's, that's going to be our prim primary mean of communication um, uh, for things related to the release. So that's all I have. Thank you. Thank you, guys. All right. Thanks, Jakob. 
Okay, so we have the sprint highlights um, for each team captured here in the deck, um, but you're going to see much of this in the actual sprint uh, demos. So I'm just gonna jump to that part. Um, and this time we are starting, we are starting with stacks with Dennis Bridges. Are you on Dennis? Hello, yes, I am here. Hello, all right, I'll stop sharing. Just changing my audio settings a little bit here. I hope that's better for everybody. Um, so there are just a couple of things that I was hoping to demo for you. Our front-end team is actually away today. Um, can I share my screen? And there is a small issue. So I'm gonna be able to show a portion of it. Um, we've had two sort of major highlights that thought folks would be interested in. We now have sample data in the testing environment for the funds uh, or the finance application. So here you can see there are two ledgers. There are roughly 20 budgets or funds and budgets associated with those funds and one fiscal year. So if you're needing to leverage the finance application and there are a few integrations that may be doing this in the near future. So all of this data is now in here. Which are connected to budgets and fiscal years and so on. So all's working there nicely. I was hoping to walk through creating an order, purchase order and some purchase order lines using the testing environment. However, it looks like um, there's a permissions issue here in seeing the add new, which we've seen a couple times before. So I won't be able to show this, but we'll have to save it for the next sprint. And then, so that's really all I have today. Thanks, Dennis. Are there any questions for Dennis? The exciting thing is Borders is now in testing. So we have our yay. three applications yay, yay, here, Borders, yay. Vendors, Finance, Orders. Um, and yeah, we'll do a full walkthrough next time. Acquisitions is coming to life. Yeah, it's looking good. Okay. All right. Thank you, Dennis. Um, let's see. So the next um, up is Frontside with Carol and Jeffrey. Hi. Can you hear me, everyone? Yeah, I can. Okay, great. Just trying to share my screen here. I think Dennis okay. might have to stop. Yeah, there we go. Okay. Let me try sharing again. Okay. Um, okay. So can you all see my screen? Yes. Okay. So um, what I was going to demo, what I'm planning to demo today are some updates that we've made to providers in the eHoldings app. So um, we've added, if I search for provider Gale, we've added a new provider settings section here. Um, and in it, we've added um, the capability to view proxy information and token information. So <clears throat> the proxy information, which is I'm showing here, it shows <clears throat> the fact whether or not it's inherited and it shows the, the proxy name. So the proxies are typically set, um, the overall available proxies are set at the customer level and then you can either adjust them here at the um, provider level or, um, you know, just, you know, either use the inherited or uh, I can show you the editing features of it too. Now the provider token, um, here we show the um, a prompt for the provider token and actually the token value. Not all providers support tokens, but Gale is one that actually does. So um, I'll go in. I'll go in here. We've added 
as part of this sprint, we also added the ability to edit providers. So we can go in and edit. And here you can see we've got the selection of available proxies. Again, Gail, um, we've had it set so that it inherits the proxy from the customer level, but you could actually change it to another proxy level. Um, and then you could also, in here, update um, the provider token. So for the provider token, we display um, help text um, that gives you some hints in terms of what it is that you're setting for the provider token. So in here, for, for Gail, for example, we're setting a site ID. So in here, you'd input your particular site ID, and then we could um, you could save it. So this is um, set here. Um, so the the information that's set at the provider level is applies to um, the lower levels packages and titles. So um, yeah, so that's it for um, provider edit. Um, I can probably I don't know if there's any questions. So that looks great, Carol. It's interesting. It looks like you guys are leveraging one of the um, patterns that UX is exploring where to edit instead of clicking on the edit pencil icon in the right, you actually click on the, the header yes. there. Yes. yes, we have both capabilities. Yes. Okay. Yes. Yep. Interesting to see that in action. Okay. All righty. So I'll stop sharing. All right, thanks. And Jeffrey, did you have something you wanted to show? I do. Uh, we'll share my screen. Okay. Um, so I wanted to share um, some more e-holding stuff. Um, we had um, previously, when you were looking at a provider, you could search in the list of, of packages that that provider has. We've now added that same capability to when I'm looking at a package right here, I can now search the list of titles for that package. Um, so let's search for, uh, let's try physics. You see, I get this, this pop-up um, that has basically this, all of the same filters that would have been available to me as if I were searching for a title over here. Um, but in this pop-up, I'll go ahead and search. Um, and it indicates that I have a filter applied. And let's actually, uh, let's only look at selected ones. That. Okay, um, and then over here we've got, um, oh, this is a, a refactor of the way that we set uh, coverage dates. Um, so we wanted to make it really clear um, that when um, you choose on a, I guess this is a managed uh, package uh, title, um, that when you choose custom coverage dates, um, that's overriding managed coverage dates. Um, and then let's actually set some coverage dates here. Um, so we'll do a very, very limited set of coverage dates. Usually they're in the order of years, not days. Um, but uh, we have very small coverage dates. And then this is what actually we'll display to the patron. Um, we can choose to show the dates or we can actually have a more custom coverage statement like uh, we only have 2014 titles uh, kind of thing. Um, so that is uh, a much more sophisticated um, and, and uh, expressive way um, to, to set custom coverage dates um, than what was previously there. Um, so the other big piece of work that happened uh, was around layout. Um, so previously we would um, always have this pane open. Um, you can now collapse it um, and it indicates the number of filters that show there. Um, so with that uh, work that we did the past couple of weeks, uh, FrontSide has basically handed off e-holdings to, to EBSCO at this point, um, and Taras Mankowski and I will continue to be working on some stuff in Folio, um, but we now have a new backlog. Um, so we're working very closely with John Coburn um, on component stuff. We'll also be uh, hopping into a lot of testing and accessibility stuff. Um, so um, if you see us uh, hacking on a lot of components, that's what's up. All right, that is all I got. Thanks, Jeffrey. Any questions for Jeffrey or Carol? Okay, cool. Um, all right, so the next person um, I have 
uh, is Vince. And Vince, I have a slide for you. Which, Great. Thanks, Kate. Uh, if I can get there. Yeah. Uh, Next one. Okay. Oh, there we go. There you go. All right. Okay, so I wanted to um, give an update. I don't have a demo, unfortunately, not this sprint. Going to be the, next one. Uh, the FSC team has been working on uh, progress in the auditing and analytics area, and uh, in particular, focusing on auditing functionality in the last couple of sprints. Uh, and I wanted to give the community a, a chance to uh, get a peek at the, some of the excellent work that's been done there. Um, we have uh, Hongwei and Tanuja from EBSCO working on these things. Uh, on the, this chart here, I think, presents sort of the discovery and the, uh, the progress that they've been making so far in context to auditing and analytics. And uh, to remind everybody, we had a POC a while back to uh, experiment with how we could extract data from, EBS, from the folio systems and uh, provide them to, an, uh, to a reporting analytics system. Uh, broken down essentially into the first column, we have uh, multiple steps that are involved in doing this. We've got extraction of the data from folio. We've got the transport of the data into uh, some sort of or some kind of system we'd like to do. We'd like to have the persistence of the data somewhere, implicitly a data lake. Um, and we want to do some enhancement of that data because it's transactional data coming from our copy. And eventually, finally, get to the visualization stage where we can show some reports and, and actual analytics or uh, such. So these lead to a number of different options for how these things can happen at each of the steps, which I've outlined here in column one. Uh, not to focus on those right now, but the assumption has been all along that auditing and, and analytics are very similar. Therefore, we could leverage some of the same uh, developments, some of the same approaches for both of these. And the team went into this uh, effort right here, looking at auditing in particular, because we've done some progress on analytics so far. So let's focus on, on auditing now. And um, with some experimentations, a couple of spikes, uh, there's been some analysis done and some prototyping with the realization that uh, auditing is somewhat uh, different than analytics. And so uh, on the extraction side, uh, the conclusion we come to is that it's, it's fine to do uh, extraction of the data, but the, the data that you extract for the two different purposes might be slightly different. We have uh, a focus on headers versus responses. We have some amount of processing that's gonna be required for auditing data. And most importantly, um, the realization that in order to be effective in auditing, it's important to normalize your data. So there is going to be an auditing schema applied, which the team has now uh, developed as a first pass. Um, and we go into the next steps of the process, transport, it turns out we've experimented a little bit, we've tried and successfully demonstrated we could push the data out into a RabbitMQ or even into a Kafka system, but the value wasn't particularly clear in doing that. So the team is now focused for the purposes of getting uh, something up and running from end to end as quickly as possible on pushing the auditing data with that schema that I mentioned directly into Postgres. Um, <clears throat> then we're going to deal with the enhancement phase, but as I mentioned, there's been some pre-processing of the data in auditing, so it's questionable whether we even need to do the enhancement phase for the auditing piece. And finally, we'll get to the visualization piece, which is the work plan for the next couple sprints. Um, initially, I think we're going to focus on providing uh, a CLI to extract the, the auditing data that's been captured out. Uh, this is probably the easiest and most flexible way to do it because once you capture this in some format, say CSV or, or uh, then you can export it into uh, any system you want for further analysis. And eventually, I think we'll, we'll work on um, requirements and how we're going to expose this directly within Folio. So um, this is the progress on auditing. Uh, just as a reminder on the analytics side, uh, we have a different approach so that uh, you will see that there is, you know, no schema involved there. There is, you know, much interest in the in the actual response body that comes back in the transactions. There is no processing required because the goal is to push it onto a data lake and capture the integrity of the data as opposed to uh, inserting any kind of delays that would potentially uh, slow that down. We have some choices to look at in terms of uh, message queues that we want to do. In particular, you'll notice that Kafka is sort of bridging between the two in the sense that it is a solution which very nicely might provide us with both persistence and transport. And 
I've been rambling on for quite a while, so I'll just wrap this up because I know we're, we're tight on time. I'll point out that the, uh, the color scheme on this chart is indicating sort of the work that we anticipate is going to happen within Folio versus the work that is either not going to be needed in the case of auditing the grayed out boxes or work that is going to be done uh, beyond the boundaries of Folio itself in the case of analytics. Once you push it out into the data lake, you've now left the environment of Folio per se. And that's what I have. Thanks, Vince. And is the thought that like the, the um, you know, the gray boxes, particularly with analytics, but maybe also with auditing, is that sort of where the um, reporting SIGs um, data warehouse reference implementation might kind of pick up? Yes, absolutely. So the, the, uh, the reference implementation is essentially the uh, lot third col the column over on the right, the last three rows grayed out. That is essentially the, uh, the work that's being done there. And we're, um, I should point out that we're uh, working with that uh, development effort right now to provide them with some data that they can use to move ahead with their development. Oops, perfect. Any questions for Vince? All right, cool. Thanks for the update, Vince. All right. Uh, okay, um, the Foley Jet team is up next with Alexi. Hello, all. Hello. Uh, let me share my screen. Okay, do you see it? Yes. Nice. Um, let me um, share some stuff we add to uh, mod uh, login uh, to login module at uh, folio system uh, it uh, was add, added um, counting of failed login attempts and uh, after uh, some failed uh, login uh, the user will be uh, blocked after it uh, and um, uh, also, we can uh, f uh, configure this uh, login attempts very flexible uh, using mod configuration. So uh, let me uh, present it. Uh, for presentation, I create um, a new user, test user. It's uh, this user is active, and uh, now we try to login. Uh, we uh, try to login with uh, uh, six successfully it's ok and uh, now uh, okay uh, uh, let me clarify uh, for uh, for default values uh, of uh, number of uh, login uh, failed login attempts we use uh, an five login attempts and timeout for this attempts is uh, 10 minutes if we want to uh, change these values, we can overwrite it using mod configuration. Uh, so now we have a default value. It's uh, five uh, failed login attempts to block user. So we can try to fail login five times. And after uh, five uh, fifths uh, failed login, uh, this user is blocked and we have a message about it. Uh, user must be flagged as active because now this user is uh, inactive. Uh, and uh, we can try to login as admin and check it. Users inactive. Okay, uh, and uh, now we can see that this user status is inactive. We can change it to active. And login with this user. Okay, uh, also if uh, we have uh, some uh, failed login uh, logins and uh, 
after it we uh, after this we login with uh, uh, correct password uh, this uh, login attempts counter is dropped uh, will be dropped and uh, for block user we need now uh, five uh, failed logins um, and uh, let me uh, share you how we can customize um, uh, th these uh, properties, uh, how we can customize a number of uh, failed attempts. Uh, if we add um, a property to mod configuration, uh, it will override the default value. And uh, now we set a value to to uh, to failed login attempts before the user will be blocked. Uh, so successfully login and now first one, second one and user is blocked after the second uh, failed uh, attempt to login. Uh, and um, using this mode configuration, we can uh, flexible uh, override th this uh, configuration on tenant level. Uh, and um, it, it, it's all from my side. Maybe some questions. <laughs> This looks great. Um, it's nice to see this coming together. It's been kind of hanging out there for a while. We knew it was something we needed to, to take care of the local password management. It's great to see it come together. Thanks, Alexi. Thank you. Okay. Um, okay, so next up, um, we're going to have demos from the ERM development teams. So um, first, um, Ian Ibbotson. Um, with the ERM functionality, and then afterwards we'll do Bjorn Mushal with e-usage. Thanks, Kate. Um, let me share my screen. Okay, hopefully you can see a folio window. Yes. Cool. Um, so, uh, fair, fair warning. Um, this demo is coming to you by, by virtue of an exception. Uh, this isn't committed and tested code. This is just uh, an early access preview of, of what we've been up to. Um, so I'll quickly run through what we've been doing. Um, it shouldn't take very long at all. Um, we've been working on a dash because it seemed like the most logical landing place for people who are doing ERM functionality, but not very much of this is functional uh, at the moment. Um, we've been doing some work on agreements. Agreements are the core abstraction of the ERM model and they're the, the linking piece between uh, packages and titles and licenses. And you can think of them as if an e-resources librarian had to gather together everything to do with one particular agreement they had with a content provider to give access to electronic journals then an agreement is a little bit like that digital folder where I, I put the license and I put the list of titles and I put a sheet of paper that says this is when I have to renew this or this is when I can cancel this by. Um, so that's our, our core abstraction, if you like, and the core uh, feature, I guess, in many ways, that ERM is adding to Folio, that ability to manage these things. Um, we know we've got some work to do on the UI. We have been focusing on the data um, so we've just started to build presentation components for the work. Over here you can see the trial agreement and agreements are composed of agreement lines, uh, which we tend to call entitlements. And you can see that this package has two entitlements. One entitles us to a specific title, uh, which in this case is clinical cancer drugs, and a package of titles, and the package is the American Psychological Association master list. That probably wouldn't happen in real life, uh, but it's a, a reasonable example. We see this screen as the probably the workhorse of the ERM application. This is where most of our users are going to spend a lot of their time day in, day out. Um, we spent a lot of time discussing with uh, the EBSCO guys uh, and the eHoldings guys about the relationship between our work and eHoldings. 
we collect data from some remote knowledge bases and have harvested a little bit of data here. So you can see we've got about 50,000 uh, records of different titles in different packages on different platforms. Um, but in this screen, users aren't selecting content to switch it on. They're selecting content in order to put it through their purchasing process, which is, which is subtly different. And they're using different sources for this data. So um, although I've already got this as a record, if I want to find clinical cancer drugs, uh, you can see that currently I've got uh, six options for that kind of title. Um, and I might choose to buy uh, clinical cancer drugs on platform Bentham Science through this particular package, uh, which is a consortial specific package. Currently what we're working on is um, a way to do multiple selections and invoke actions and tasks. Uh, we've called them activities and, and I think Jill is working with Philip on the user experience for that because those activities are short-lived things, but they're not persistent data. So I'm going to gather these five titles together and I'm going to pipeline them into an orders process, for example. Um, so that's, uh, that's what this screen is doing. And then across the top, uh, we have some other ways of looking at the data because obviously what you have is a kind of star schema uh, with the knowledge base entries at the middle, but then lots of different ways of filtering that data. Uh, and so we're trying to give the, the users different ways to, to come up the data. Um, but yeah, that's, that's what we've been up to so far. And uh, I believe the next two weeks, we're gonna spend doing more work on agreements on this screen in particular, and trying to tidy up some of the, uh, the, UX, the UX. So uh, I think I'm gonna hand over to uh, colleagues on um, metrics and usage data. Sure. Looks great, Ian. Let me stop sharing now. Yeah. <clears throat> Thank you. So I hope you can hear me. Yes, we can. Great. Um, just a moment. Okay, so yes, uh, since this is the very first participation of our library uh, here in the sprint review, I will give you a brief overview first of the current undertaking and intention what we do. Um, we aim at providing a app to incorporate uh, counter usage uh, statistics in Folio. This uh, development is all under the ERM umbrella, so to speak. And we share the same subsig as well as the uh, same PO, which is uh, Owen Stevens. And uh, yeah, what's the scope? Um, you will be able to enter your sushi credentials and um, more harvesting configuration. You can choose the desired report you want to have. The app will then uh, automatically harvest um, the counter files and you will also be able to manually upload counter files. The files are then stored in a raw format as it is. And yeah, we uh, try to support national usage statistics portals. That's a kind of aggregating services. And uh, we have uh, one in Germany. Uh, we have a lot of information uh, from this uh, service, but there are also services in the UK and the US, I think, and we have to look into this later. We will also have some monitoring features to see whether there is an error in harvesting activities or not. And uh, yeah, the overall aim at the end is to provide this data to the ERM app for in-app reports. Yes, if you're interested in the project plan and the data model or wireframes, um, you can find this in the Folio Wiki under uh, resource management ERM usage. Yeah, what I demo today is the first bullet, um, the user interface for um, the configuration. And yeah, I have to admit that this is all under development and it's not, not done yet. I switch over to the interface. Yes, uh, we make use of two further apps at the moment. This is vendor and settings. The interface itself is obvious. I think uh, you can search and filter for uh, platforms. You see all information on the right side. And um, yeah, 
here's the link to the vendor information in the vendor app where you can find contact information and so on. And if you create a new record, you can um, make a vendor lookup and choose from this app. And yeah, it's, it's linked then. This will be the platform ID from the ERM app later. And uh, we will have a look up there as well. Below you have uh, the harvesting configuration. You can set the status, whether it's active or inactive or not possible to harvest information. And um, you can also choose whether this uh, statistics are uh, harvested uh, via an aggregator or not. If so, you can choose the aggregator here. This is um, specified in the settings app. Um, yeah, we can enter more technical information uh, for the um, service API to call this. And yes, you can choose your um, your reports here, counter four, counter five. This is in a transition at the moment from version four to five. You can add um, your desired reports. You can add some more reports. And below that, you have uh, Sashi credentials with yeah the necessary information: custom ID, requester ID, API key and so on. Yes. And that's all for the demo, I think. Yes. Thank you. Any questions to this? Where um, I saw a pop-up list of vendors is that a separate vendor file that was built specifically for this app or is that the same vendor app that's being used? No, that, it's, it's a vendor lookup uh, from the vendor app. Ah, perfect. Okay, yeah, thank it's, you. It's integrated here. You can um, search and choose and then it's linked <laughs> via the UUID. Yes. Nice, thank mm -hmm. you. This is really nice, Bjorn. It's it's really cool to see um, you know existing patterns and components in use. The integration with vendors it's really cool. Have you been able? Have you been doing much, most of this pretty independently, or have you gotten a lot of support from the the core team or or the acquisitions teams? Well, I have to admit, I'm the librarian. I'm not the developer. Ah, <laughs> but okay. as far as I know, it's yeah, it has uh, developed quite independently. Yeah, that's great. I think this this one is, is copy and pasted from another app. <laughs> so Great. this exists now. Okay. Okay. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Okay. Let's see. I actually had um, Tiziana from at cult next, but I'm not sure if she's here yet. Are you on Tiziana? Uh, sorry, hi Kate. Uh, Tiziana now is not oh. available. Is still uh, uh, in her other meeting. Yes, yes. So please, uh, if you can postpone. Yes, no okay, problem. Thank you. Okay. After uh, six, uh, after uh, sixteen. Oh, okay. All right, uh, well, 18, we... Sorry. Okay. No worries. Okay. Thanks, Annalisa. Thank you. Thank you. All right, then we'll jump over to the core team. Um, and we've got Mark Deutsch, Michal Kuklis, and Julian Ladish. So we'll start with you, Mark. Hey. There. hey. I'm going to start sharing. <laughs> Running off of localhost right now uh, because I'm on the Google Live. You're kind of faint, Mark. We can't hear you very well. Um, how about this? It gets a little better. Let's try it. Okay. Um, oh, that's a lot better. Okay, perfect. Uh, all right, so caveat is that I'm on the local host right now because the GBV Wi-Fi um, is, for some reason, not letting us connect to the Folio backend uh, Okapi servers. 
Um, so I'm just going to demo a couple of smaller things um, regarding user permissions. Um, so we've added the service points uh, work in the past. Um, and so now we're adding the permission sets related to that. So I've gone ahead and created these three users uh, for a demo. So we have this one that uh, just has the ability to view user profiles. This one has just the ability to view service points assigned to users, which is a new permission set. And this user has the ability to assign and unassign service points to users. So while doing this, I, I noticed that there was a bit of an issue with um, how permission sets like this one or the ability to assign and unassign permission sets to users function um, in that they're not like a, a, a pure superset of the functionality required to accomplish their task. Um, so previously, if you had um, a permission set like this one, you actually wouldn't have the ability to hit, to hit the edit uh, icon over here. So that was a series of bugs that I fixed while implementing this as well. Um, but if we see what this actually looks like, so when I'm logged in as this user, we only see the, the basic data um, when we're viewing a, uh, a user's record. We don't see any of the service point data. We don't see their, their permission data, just the, just the simple stuff. Um, if we log out and go to that other user who has the, the view service points permission, then this user can actually see and expand that service points data but they still don't have the, the edit icon. And finally, if you're given just that edit service points permission, you not only get the ability to view users, view their service points data, uh, but you also get the ability to edit it. So we can go ahead and add another service point and we see that reflected over there. So just some small stuff, but uh, I guess stuff that needed to be done and bug fixes that needed to be fixed. And that's it. Thanks, Mark. Okay, Michal. You are up. Uh, thanks, Kate. Hi, everyone. Uh, can you uh, can you see my screen here? Yes, we can. Um, so I have a couple couple different stories to show you. Um, some of them will be from uh, the work Aditya did. Um, the Aditya is on vacation, so I'm going to just present a couple of his stories as well. Um, so the, the first thing thing. The first feature Aditya was working on here is uh, this new staff slip called Transit. So as you can see, we can get there from circulation staff slip and, and uh, Transit is now available on the list. Um, and it's very similar to what we had in Hold where you can see, see the details of the Transit, but you can also go to the edit, edit mode here and um, work on your template and a couple of additional items. Um, the, the difference between halt and transit here is that you are able to choose different kind of like, uh, tokens or tags here when you create uh, your your template. Um, so, for example, we have from location or to location available to us. Um, and then, sorry, this down here. And then um, the same is also now available from your uh, details view. Uh, um, together with this little preview, so you can kind of see uh, how your template is, is looking like. like. Uh, so this is the transit. Um, another thing Aditya was working on here was uh, this ability to see the meta metadata from the permission sets. Uh, I believe this was missing before, so now we can, we can see that here. 
Uh, there are a couple additional stories, but I, I think Aditya will be able to present them during the next next demo. Um, so that's that's it for Aditya's work. Um, and now I'm going to switch to um, the work I've, I've been doing. This is mostly related to our service point work. Um, and the first case here will be will show you the what happens when you try to log in with the with the user without um, preferred service point uh, selected. So let me just try to log in here. Um, so as you can see, um, we are now presented with the new model, uh, which allows us to select a service point. Um, this is something which we didn't have before, and this is only happening when given user uh, doesn't have the preferred service point selected um, before. So let, let me just choose one of them. Um, we also added this new ability here to switch to a different service point under my profile menu here. So if you if you want to switch on uh, service point later on, you can always come back here and choose a different one. Um, and uh, additionally, you can also see the current service point uh, you are working from uh, under here, um, under my profile menu as well. Um, so this is this is one case, but there are there are a couple of more cases. Additional uh, another case here is um, this again here uh, the case where uh, we are working with the user without uh, any service points uh, selected. Let me just log, log out here and I'll log in again. And as you can see, um, we, we don't see the same uh, pop-up as before because um, this given user didn't have any service points selected. Um, so you can still log in and you can navigate between different apps. But what's different here is that when you try to go to the checkout, or check-in uh, module, you can now see this access denied uh, pop-up, which will basically indicate that you, you have to select um, a service point before you can continue. Uh, and I think this is it from me, so I'm not sure if there are any, any, any questions. Looks good, Michal, thank you. Thank you. I know that was a lot of work. Okay, um, great. All right, and then I think Julian has something to show us an enhancement to loan rules. Are you on, Julian? Yes, hello. I hello. present about the comments in the loan rules editor. And uh, there are two possibilities. One is using the hash, and the other one is using two slashes. And the thing with the slash is that it's, uh, you can use it as a section that can be folded and unfolded so that if the file is big, you can see it better. And uh, the change is that we have uh, also some documentation in the mod circulation GitHub account. And uh, there is the loan rules explanation. And we added also the line comment um, to the GitHub. Yeah, and that's it. Short and sweet. <laughs> it looks though like it really makes the loan rules editor a lot more readable, a lot more user friendly. So nice, nice enhancement. Um, all right. So um, let's see. Jakob, I guess we can do your platform slides now and then we'll circle back to at cult afterwards. Are you on, Jakob? Hi, Gate. Sorry, just looking for the for the mute button. Uh, I think I'll attach them and circulate them with your email. Okay. Um, okay. Let me just see if Tiziana is on then, because that was the last demo that we had, and uh, I know she wasn't going to be able to jump on until right at the hour. Um, just a minute, I think that uh, she need uh, only five minutes, uh, I check.
That's while she's checking, actually. Why don't I just present the rest of the, uh, the slides? <clears throat> All right. So, okay, we covered those. Um, yeah, so just um, the wrap up slides. Um, so, next uh, upcoming sprints are sprint 46 and 47, both of which are two week sprints. So, we'll meet again at the end of September um, for our next sprint review. Um, and we do have um, what each team is planning for their coming sprints here in the slides. Um, so if you want to take a look at what people are, are planning next, you can see that here. And yeah, and that's really it. Um, I guess we could also uh, circle back on the release. I don't know if there were any questions. We kind of rushed through the release timeline in case anyone had any questions. Let me go back to that slide while we wait for at cult. Uh, hold on. There it is. Did anyone have any questions about about the timeline for Jakob. Any other questions or things you'd like to circle back on? All right. Annalisa or Titiana, are you, do you guys think you'll be ready to present? Yes, Kate, I'm here. Oh, great, oh, you're here. I'm sorry for late, but I was involved in another meeting. No worries, so, we actually just wrapped up a lot faster than I expected. I'm glad um, you're here. Okay, so uh, just a few minutes for us, because uh, uh, as I told you, um, we now present are presenting uh, um, the the scan or browse uh, uh, a way to find a record. That means uh, to scan an index and uh, to retrieve a record from an index. Just uh, one specification about uh, this function, because uh, we uh, what we are presenting now is related uh, related to uh, back office, not to front end, to uh, back end, not to front end, because about the front end we are discussing with David and Philip. So this is not our final proposal. It's just to show you the function. Okay. So uh, the the cataloger can select uh, the an index as uh, we already Tiziana? showed. Yes. Did you did you want to show anything? Ah, yes, I need to show, share the screen. I'm sorry. Okay. Okay. Do yep. you see? Okay. We do. Yes. Okay. So you can, uh, the cataloger uh, um, can uh, type or select uh, a, an index from uh, uh, available index for browse or scan function. And uh, he can type uh, the text to scan and uh, the, the function uh, go to an index, uh, in this case for, for title. So you find all uh, title uh, alphabetically ordered and you can select something here of course, don't consider the database. We have not uh, a record now in this test database. But starting from here, you have the title heading listed in an alphabetical way. And see here, you, you see a la storia because we consider la as a not as a skip search so not important word so all title are listed under storia and here you have 
the local database where the heading is managed and you have the name title uh, heading that meets the combination between a name and title. You have here the cross-reference uh, that means a CC also and so on reference for this heading. You have the authority record if uh, someone provided to them and you have a document that means the link with the bibliographic record where this heading is present and uh, you have also some additional uh, field that is uh, the level of authentication, uh, the language of indexing, indexing and the, the language of access point. So starting from now, you can uh, click, uh, for example, on document and uh, see uh, the document. So uh, just, to be, just to resume, the function is ready, so is uh, the scan search and now we start working on a user interface when we finish with the search function. Stop. So stop for today. Okay. <laughs> okay. Great. Um, are there questions for Titiana? I guess Hi. just one quick one. There, this is not in the main code yet, right? This is still... Yeah. Oh, As can we see it on Snapshot Stable yet or no? Uh, 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 Anne-Marie, you mean as a release, if it is already released? Right. Can we see it on Folio Testing or Folio Snapshot no, Stable? I'm, or okay. No, I'm sorry, because we need to finish our release process, uh, but also for uh, simple search and so on. So we prefer to close this function before release in the common content. Okay. Just check okay. on. Thank you. Tiziana, do you um, plan to have some or all of this um, released in Q3? Or are you more targeting Q4 at this point? Yes, yes, absolutely. Uh, um, we, we think to have probably in uh, Q3 the search the search, so the, the main function to search a record. But uh, frankly speaking, it depends by our agreement with David and Philip because we need to avoid to do something that after we need the trash as, uh, as happened in the past. Mm. So we are working uh, strictly with David and I suppose David with Philip and with the Marcat subgroup to 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 agree in the user interface for search start starting from search and to close this uh, uh, we hope uh, for uh, q3 uh, for q3 yes okay great so maybe okay. we will see it soon okay all right yeah thank you titiana thank you to all Okay, any last thoughts or questions? All right, I guess we will close a little early. That went much faster than I expected. Um, amazing work, everyone. The breadth of what's happening on this project is really mind blowing. It's very cool to see what everybody's working on. So thanks um, as always to the presenters and to everyone who attended and I'll be sending out um, links to the deck and the recording shortly. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Kate. Bye-bye. Bye. -bye. Bye.